<laughs> okay. There we go. Um, now go ahead. Okay, thank you. As you know, I'm Judge Rebecca Robertson with the King County District Court West Division. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I have, before being appointed to King County District Court in December, I was a judge in Federal Way Municipal Court for 12 years. So I've had a dozen years of daily judicial experience and a proven track record regarding inclusive leadership. Uh, the judicial system is transforming itself to meet the changing needs of the people it serves addressing every day the overlapping challenges of mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, and systemic racism. We're reimagining what we do every day. There are many moving parts and stakeholders in the justice system, and I've had years of experience building coalitions in my own court and statewide to create real results. I was president of the District and Municipal Court Judges Association in 2018. I've worked with judges in other state holders who eagerly embrace innovation and some who don't. I have experience collaborating with all of them to create actual meaningful solutions. In 2018, I spearheaded the creation of a community court in federal way with no funding uh, to address the underlying issues that cause people to commit crimes. We provide people, we provided people with mentors, intensive support, quick linkages to treatment and housing. Uh, the courts must be able to provide immediate resources to people to empower them to address their own issues. And what I've learned from the successes of this model of community court can be applied to other aspects of the justice system. Some people are amenable to this treatment. Some people are not. Some uh, we have to put in jail. Some we have to issue warrants for. But what we're trying to do most of the time is to address the un underlying issues that folks are experiencing to get them out of the criminal justice. In seconds. I have the experience and the leadership skills to help King County continue to move in this direction. I would be honored by your endorsement and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. Oh, I came in right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead with our uh, prepared questions now. Um, Laura, do you wanna go ahead and ask the first question? Sure. Uh, what are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? So I've been in the criminal justice system now for over 20 years. Uh, I was a prosecutor I, for City of Kent and City of Seattle, and then I was a judge in Federal Way for 12 years, and now with King County for almost six months now. So I definitely have the experience to do the job. It is my, it is the job I'm currently doing. I have been involved in the changes in the justice system that we have seen over the last decade or so in terms of a more coordinated response towards treatment, towards responding people to, to people's needs where they are, to getting them treatment, to really assisting um, them in their lives so that they do not commit other crimes. I have also taken a strong leadership role in the statewide judiciary where I've worked on issues like um, state court courtwide security issues, the creation of the Council on Independent Courts, public defender standards that limits the amount of cases public defenders can take uh, so that they can do the best job possible. So I've had a lot of experience working with other courts as well to get good ideas from them and to really understand what works for different populations, what works in bigger courts and smaller courts. And so I've had all those experiences that I think make me well suited to King County District Court. Thank you. Barbara, do you want to ask the next question? I'd be happy to. So in what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? So first, I think we could get rid of all the filing fees that we have. We have user fees. So people who are of limited or low means to be able to file a small claim suit, to be able to file a small a small lawsuit or even for a protection order, uh, they are charged fees to be able to do so. And often it is a barrier to access to justice. Sec so I think getting rid of filing fees is very important. Secondly, there is a large push towards providing attorneys for some civil actions, uh, especially in family court where people's custody issues with their children are on the line. And I definitely support the movement towards doing that, since it, it often is just as important in any, in any 
thing we do in the criminal arena because of the effect it would have on the person's life. Definitely judicial reform in terms of uh, modifying rules to make it continuances and um, abuse by attorneys less able to happen and less uh, and more able to be controlled by the court. I actually sat on a task force to amend the civil rules to make it less expensive for litigants to kind of curb attorney abuses. So I understand that that is also an issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And uh, Sherry, can you take the next question? Yes. Um, if presiding over a criminal docket, what role do you think judges should take and would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, and other diversion programs to other alternatives to our incarceration? So certainly as much as the law allows, the usually it's the prosecutor who will agree to send someone to an aversion co a diversion court. It's very hard to force a, the government actor, the prosecuting attorney uh, to do so. I've certainly asked questions of the attorneys, asked questions about, uh, can I talk to your supervisor the, about this? I think this would be a good case for community court, even if you're not referring it right now and encourage them to kind of see the bigger picture and why this might be a better uh, situation for that person. Judges are often very involved in the creation of these courts and there are agreements with the attorneys going into uh, the creation of these courts as to what kind of uh, cases will be heard. And so judges certainly get involved in that way. And I do believe in diversion courts and in treatment courts uh, and hope that there can be more in King County. Thank you. Great. And Consuelo, can you take the next question? Absolutely. Can you hear me? I can sure hear can. you. Okay. Um, what is your position on bail reform? What factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail? And what changes would you advocate for, if any, if elected? So I think we, in terms of bail form in general, reform in general, we need a better system for pretrial alternatives to bail. Um, if someone is, if bail is set to ensure someone's presence uh, after multiple failures to appear, then obviously someone who has means can post that while someone who does not means have means cannot. We wanna get those people to be able to appear, but we understand that some people simply just cannot afford bail. So a really robust pretrial services where they have to check in somewhere every day, they have access to services, their monitored pretrial, I think is a much better and less expensive option than setting bail and to ensure their presence. In terms of what I would look for in setting bail uh, is what the court rules require me to look for and only that, what their history of failure to appear is, willful failure to appear and their risk to public safety, their future dangerous, uh, of a future uh, ability or fear that they're going to commit a violent crime. You know, if, I would, if it were up to me and making the law and it's up to the legislature, I would certainly create a much more robust pretrial diversion services and alternatives for everyone across the state. And I would maybe give judges more leeway to have an option of no bail on folks who are incredibly dangerous. I'm sure you hear of people posting bail and uh, going and committing a, a violent crime and that is of serious concern for the judges who, you know, are there to protect public safety as well. But we always have to be mindful of if it's not an issue of violence, if it's about an issue of someone appearing, we need better alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're um, going to see if the executive board has any questions. And just a reminder that the responses to these questions are one minute. Anyone have any questions for Judge Robertson? Clayton. Um, hi, uh, hi. Robertson, and welcome to the 36th. Um, you. you used the metaf uh, metaphor. Uh, I would like you to elaborate on a little bit. Uh, moving parts. Um, you said there are many moving parts. Uh, could you tell us what you mean by moving parts? What is a moving part? So there are just Aside so many. <laughs> yeah. There are so many dynamic actors in the criminal justice system, starting with the police who make the arrests, 
the mental health providers who may be on scene, the victim advocates who talk to the victim, the public defenders whose interest is to zealously represent their client, the prosecutors who have immense power in charging decisions and what people will be charged with, which may make a significant difference, what they're charged with may make a significant difference in whether they'll go to jail or not. Um, and then the, ju the judges themselves. There are also all the treatment providers that we coordinate with. So trying to get all of these moving parts together to create a forward momentum uh, to really enact some positive change takes um, a lot. And not all of these folks are in agreement with each other, as you can well understand. Um, so that is sometimes a real juggling act, getting all of these folks together and stakeholders to talk about what the real goal is of uh, the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Laura, go ahead. I'm curious what your experience has been like uh, during the pandemic um, enter or utilizing a, a virtual um, court system, if your court did that, and whether or not you think um, there were benefits or detriments to individuals' access to the criminal justice system or the justice system. I We did hybrid court both in Federal Way and in King County. So we were uh, the judges were in the courtroom, the clerks were in the courtroom, the attorneys were either on Zoom or in person, whatever their preference, and the defendants were in person or in the courtroom, whatever their present preference. Most people appeared on Zoom. And so the judges were and the clerks were the only ones in court. That's changing now. More people are coming back to court. Um, my experience is that it is it increases access to justice in terms of it allows people to come to court without losing their job. They don't have to take a half a day off work to sit there and wait for their court hearing. They can just call in on a Zoom call, do their work, come in for their brief hearing that they may have or their longer hearing. We had a lot of people who were at work who were able to call in and have their court hearing. 10 seconds. The downside is that it's much harder to make a personal connection with someone when they're over video. And so at plea and sentencing now that we can, we're starting to require people to come back so that we can have that connection with them. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, looks like Barbara has a question. Yes. Um, so in the city of Seattle, throughout all across the city and all departments, the city is talking to its citizens, its employees, it, uh, self about institutional racism and trying to identify it and correct it. And um, I, as a, you know, as a resident of Seattle have watched copious messages go by and I've been, been invited to many workshops and people I know have gone to workshops and come back and they never, they never say anything about them. Um, I would like to know how has the city's stated intention about institutional racism come to the municipal court? And could you give me an example of something that uh, is happening that might not have happened before uh, we woke up to this and applied so much energy to it? So it definitely has come to the courts and it had come to the courts much longer before it came, uh, became uh, kind of more part of the public spectrum. Uh, we've had, we have numerous trainings multiple times a year on recognizing implicit bias on how to respond to implicit or explicit bias, both in ourselves and with the attorneys, how to respond to folks in court who have different live, lived experiences and how we're going to react to them to looking at our court rules and our statutes and our laws to determine is there some inherent racism in this, in this particular law. Uh, the prosecutors, in my experience going through uh, in King County, have had similar training. So they're looking at those things too. It has definitely been a large part of what the seconds. justice system has been doing uh, over the last several years. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like Consuelo has a, um, a an analog hand up. Go ahead, Consuelo. Yes. <laughs> um, I was listening to the news this morning and I specifically wanted to ask this of you because you mentioned community court 
And you, you are probably aware that um, Seattle has um, decided not to allow repeat offenders to go into community court. And I was wondering if we could just get a sense from you of your thoughts surrounding that decision. Well, it's a different court. I'm with King County District and that's Seattle Municipal. However, um, I, I, so I don't know what the internal discussions were, but they're, my understanding, you cannot force someone into treatment and into help. And so what community court is really good for is to capture someone and when they really want help and provide them access, uh, a significant amount of access to resources. I think my understanding is that the concern about these high impact offenders is that they're not amenable to treatment or to help. And so you're kind of putting them through this community court and it's not really assisting. That's my understanding. I don't know what in, went into the judge's decision to um, not allow some of those folks to community court. Ultimately, those therapeutic courts are an agreement between the prosecutors, the defense, and the courts. And so if there's not an agreement on something, um, the court just can't decide on its own what cases to allow in. Great, thank you. Um, thank I think you. it's time for a one minute wrap up. So um, please. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention to all these issues. Um, I really have spent a lot of my career trying to improve the justice system, trying to make it work better for people. Uh, we want to keep dangerous folks off the street and we want to also meet them where they are and get them the services they need so that they are not graduating to larger crimes like felonies. And I think that the district and municipal courts are in a perfect position to be able to be a change agent and to intervene in someone's downward spiral. So when people talk about wanting to keep the courts out of people's lives, sometimes it's what really spurs them to make changes in their lives. And that's what we're here for and what we really hope that we can do as well as protect the public safety. Um, as you know, Seattle has some you know crime issues and it's pretty dangerous downtown. And so we're trying to address that as well. Uh, I'm really appreciative that all of you are care about these issues and care about what the judges have to say and endorsements. And I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your time. And yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to us tonight.